everyone who's here. Thank you very much for signing in. Uh, keep in mind, uh, if you do get accidentally bumped out due to technical challenges on your end, uh, we're streaming this also on Facebook at Johnson uh, Photo Imaging. Um, I'll post the link here very shortly. So if you guys are interested in checking that out, you're more than welcome to. And you'll be able to see it there as well. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank... Um, Jillian, thank you very much for doing this. this. is very, very cool, and I appreciate it, and I hope everyone will enjoy the presentation. Uh, this is being uh, done through Tamron, a friend. You all, I also have, uh, for some of you who have met Jeff before, Jeff is also here. He's also our Tamron rep. He's, anything, any questions I come up for Tamron, I usually go to him, and then he usually asks Jillian, just, if I understand how that works. Is that how that works, yeah. Jeff? That's exactly. <laughs> So um, gets bigger. You guys are the best. <laughs> but I'm diplomatic about it. So Jillian, what would you say to that? <laughs> but uh, first of all, again, uh, just to let you know, I know some of you are not near the store here at and, and Johnson Photo, so I'll just give you a little thing about it. Johnson Photo Imaging is a full service camera store in Bradenton, Florida. Yes, that's where the dust plume is hitting, and also it's very, very hot down here. So yes, uh, we also are open uh, normal business hours, 10 to six. I am not wearing one, but we usually wear a mask when you come in and we keep everything is, as, as sanitized as best as we can. So just when you do come in, please wear a mask. We're open 10 to six, Monday through Friday and 10 to two. We carry everything Tamron, including the latest from Tamron, the FE Sony mount 28 to 200 2.8, which is awesome. <laughs> It's the first one of the kind and that I've ever seen in that range to give you so much more advantages. So for Sony users, you guys are going to be pretty drooling at that. Everybody else is just wishing Tamron would make one for theirs, I guess. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, uh, again, uh, again, um, my name is Dono. Uh, or actually, my name is Donovan. Everyone calls me Dono. Sometimes they refer to me as Photo Dono. Uh, but uh, I'm on their director of education here at Johnson Photo. Um, I help coordinate these things and put them all together. And uh, I hope you guys will enjoy it. It is being recorded. Uh, it also is streaming live on Facebook. Uh, other than that, uh, we'll be share the, we will share the recording later on as well, too. Uh, but, uh, but that'll be later on uh, once we finish processing the video for the whole thing. Other than that, I'm ready to pass on the reins to Mr. Jeff, if he's got anything he would like to say. Well, hi everybody. Welcome and thanks for coming in. Um, and thanks to uh, Dono and Jillian and everybody for helping make this happen. So I need to just adjust my screen a little bit here and um, then I can read that. Now those are just screenshots from the website. Oh, are they? Uh -huh. Okay, I just can't, I can't read which lenses they are. But anyway, um, so if you can go to our um, website, it, it's, it's um, www.tamron-usa.com, and you can find our section where it's called Homeschool. And in the Homeschool section, we have videos, um, and uh, they, they, they're done by a lot of our photographers like Jillian and the other folks that do what she does. And uh, all over the country, a lot of them are shot, and um, they're available for you there at no charge. So. Well, there what you else go. you got? Mm, no, that's <laughs> all I have for the Tamron stuff. Okay. <laughs> you always have the razzle dazzle. I'm like, yeah, it's a placeholder. <laughs> well, so anyway, you know, one of the things about Tam, I've been with Tamron. I, I'm embarrassed to tell you how many years, but. Um, Okay, 32. And um, <laughs> we started long before anybody, you know, not to be like a bragging or anything, um, with, um, we understood the importance of education and um, helping people to understand photography and develop their craft and um, that type of thing. And so I'm really proud of our team, Jillian and the rest of them for what they've put together um, over these last couple of months. It's really amazing what they've done and they've done a terrific job and um, I've come, I feel lucky to work you know, with them and with the company um, that is so education oriented. And you know, there's, there's a lot more about all that, but um, thanks again for coming in. Um, a couple of quick pointers. Um, Tamron 
is a manufacturer of lenses. And a couple of things that are unique about Tamron versus some of the others are that number one, we are we work with camera companies um, and to um, be sure that we're, our mounts and everything are compatible and everything we have relationships with them. And um, a lot of different, um, <clears throat> Well, I don't know how to say this other than we actually pay royalties to the camera companies to um, use their technology on our lenses. So we're, it's a very quality conscious company. And um, I, I could use the whole time, so I should probably shut up, Jillian. <laughs> but, and we have a six year warranty. It's the longest warranty in the industry for these types of products. And you know, I've taken my camera bodies that, that are made by other companies before and sent them in for repairs. And they take like six weeks to get back. Um, we have a policy that is 72 hours in-house turnaround, whether it's a warranty or 72 hours in-house if there was a, a re, you know, a broken product that you're gonna pay to repair. Um, and um, so, you know, you add the transportation time to that. And maybe right now you might wanna add another day or two just in case, because we're running on like a half staff in, in uh, our uh, New York uh, um, facility. So <clears throat> that's all I have for now. Uh all right. The only thing I'd like to add to that, Jeff, is if yeah. you know, I, I that your the service from Tamron was exemplary when I had a problem with the lens, I sent it in. Yeah, you know, the travel time it can't fix, but three days it was back before I knew it. It was awesome. Yeah. So, and also another thing that, that I didn't mention was that a lot of the technologies that go into Tamron lenses um, are were were pretty much innovated by Tamron, and a lot of other companies use them as well. But they are all. Um, products designed to keep the 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 Im to give you better images in a smaller lens and typically at a price that is very affordable so you're, you're looking at value which is the way i look at it so it's the performance versus the longevity that's the six-year warranty versus the amount of dollars that you spend so i'll keep bragging i'm like a dad with new kids <laughs> you know. Well, I think I'd like to get started, if that's all right with Good. you. Good. You go right ahead. <laughs> Please. I'm going to go ahead and, and mute myself and turn my video off so I don't keep popping up on there. Cool. Uh, well, you guys uh, keep an eye on the chat and make sure everybody is uh, getting all their stuff answered. Yep. Um, again, hello, hello. I'm Jillian Bell, better known as Bell Tamron USA on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Self-proclaimed professional macro photographer, current national tech rep for Tamron USA. Basically what that means is I'm a, I'm a photographer first, I'm an educator at heart. I work with Jeff who takes wonderful care of all of our local dealers over in the Florida area and the Carolinas. So he's down in the Southeast portion of the States where he's regional, I'm more national and I come out as kind of a, um, a second set of hands whenever needed when we are allowed to travel. Now this class, I, it's, it's a, um, how do I put this properly? I'm excited to give this class. This is a class I've been wanting to put together for a while. Um, it is a, a, like a one, it, it's a 2.0 class to my normal macro class. Um, it's, it's funny how when I get asked to talk about certain subjects, you ask anybody else on the Tamron tech team who knows macro and they're always talking to me because macro is how I see the world. In a portrait session, in a landscape session, in you know Milky Ways, things like that, my mind is always gravitating towards the little details into macro photography. And I had, I had a class that I gave back in May called Getting to Know My Macro Lens with the 90 millimeter focused on the how. Um, focused on lighting and backgrounds and just getting into the macro mindset. That was very foundationary. This one is a continuation of that conversation because I always get questions about extension tubes and teleconverters and focus stacking and filters and all these things. So I wanted to create this class for all of you to help get those questions answered. Um, here are the subjects we're going to focus on today. Lenses and macro accessories. Two, we're going to talk about the ratios and how to calculate them. There's a little bit of math in that section, so just be warned. Number three, getting it right in the camera. So um, reading your histogram, dealing with white balance, and just walking through a full example, showcasing how to approach it and how I think about it and create the imageries that I do. And then lastly, the art of focus stacking. 
I'm a firm believer that you find a system that works for you and stick with it. So if you, you know, you could definitely take my advice. I'm not an expert in focus stacking, but I figured out some things that work for me and you're more than welcome to this information. Um, also, the examples that I bring forward are, I try to find relatable subjects that you can easily correlate into your regular lives. Um, I'm a found objects artist in the fact that I, I really don't have time to stake out like little anthills and find bees and like make sure they're all dewy and go out at the right time of day. You know, I, you'll find me in antique stores and flea markets finding rusty stuff and, and just interesting vignettes to put together. So I really hope you enjoy these. Fresh set of images for you all today. Number one, let's talk about lenses. So there's three basic categories of, of lenses that we will use in this beyond macro technique. And when I say beyond macro, the goal here is to either get one-to-one -one macro with a lens that doesn't have that capability natively, or more specifically, getting beyond that one-to-one -one into better than life size, two-to-one, five-to-one, 10-to-one, really focusing in on itty bitty, teeny tiny little things. So conversation is gonna be primes versus zooms. A true macro is definitely, you know, when we talk about the 90 millimeter, that is the current best option in the Tamron line for macro photography. When we adapt some of the um, accessories to the 90, we're gonna have the most magnification possible. So this is the best way to get better than one-to-one -one magnification. I'll get into that. Prime lenses in general give you similar results, but I like doing prime lenses because it has a more ethereal quality to it. It's softer. Um, macro lenses, so the 90 as a whole, it has a very flat field of view. I've got that example coming up. Um, again, this is the first time I've given in this class. I'm so excited. But the prime lenses, so I'll use, you'll see the 45 millimeter used quite a bit, the 1.8. I'll also be using the 85 millimeter 1.8 to try to relate that in a 90 millimeter macro world and how those images compare. Um, you can also very easily for my Sony shooters use the, the 20, the 24, the 35. They have great close focus capability. But again, with a prime lens that is not a macro lens, it's gonna be more ethereal, it's gonna be softer, it's gonna be just light and, and airy and beautiful. Zoom lenses, they have limited working distance capabilities. Um, basically, longer zoom lenses with longer minimum object distance work better in this case. I see many people trying to use like the 18 to 400 or the 35 to 150. So I've got some great examples with the 35 to 150. Um, also some great stuff with the 150 to 600 has some good macro capabilities as well. 1B, talking about macro accessories. So when we talk about getting this macro accomplished with different things that maybe you don't have a macro lens, um, the conversation of close-up filters always comes up. The conversation of the Tamron 2X teleconverter always comes up, as well as using extension tubes and using bellows. Um, when we use close-up filters, here's my next example. So these are used with the 35 to 150. The close-up filter on the far left-hand side will give us a little bit better magnification. And just to kind of give you a visual reference of what we're photographing here, this is a, this is a page in a map book that I have. That square with those dark edges, it, that's a three quarters inch by three quarters inch. So the 35 to 150 generally has like a one to three ratio, it's a 30% uh, life size. We're dealing with imagery that's about four by six inches in, in area. And so when we use a close-up filter, there's four X ones, there's 10 X ones, there's two X ones, you know, how, how much magnification do you need? And basically the close-up filters is like a magnifying glass you put on the front of your lens. You zoom it all the way out to 150, your subject is gonna get very, very close to the front element of that lens. And optically, it's, it's not a bad picture, in comparison to using an extension tube set or using a true macro lens, there is some quality loss, especially around the edges because we're, we're distorting that light. We're, we're kind of bending the image a little bit. Um, but it's, it's a very cheap, it's a very cost effective option to have macro capability in a lens that might not give you those capabilities starting off. 
Tamron 2X teleconverter. This is a combination that I don't necessarily recommend with most zoom lenses. Um, in the case of the 18 to 400, in the case of the 35 to 150, it, it, it will mount. However, big disclaimer, don't break your glass. Um, if you try to attach this teleconverter when your lens is at its widest angle. So in this case, if I, I, I physically can't zoom out to 35 millimeter because the back element of that lens will hit the teleconverter and you will damage things. However, if you want to break the rules a little bit, don't tell them I said so. <laughs> but at 150 millimeter, again, my, my minimum focusing distance gets closer. So technically with the 2X teleconverter on the 35 to 150, I can get a 300 millimeter equivalent and get better. This is, this is almost a one-to-one -one macro. This is a one to 0.8 or something like that. So you can get much better magnification and much better detail by using a teleconverter versus close-up filter with the disclaimer that you might damage it if it's not used properly. Um, the best option and the least destructive option out of these three, if you have a zoom lens that, and you're trying to do macro, is get an extension tube set. The extension tube sets that's seen in the middle here, um, the extension tube sets are great. They definitely will allow you to um, increase your minimum focusing distance. You can literally, get closer to your subjects, you can get better magnification. Um, I highly recommend, I'll, I'll go through some examples about how to use them. But the idea with extension tubes is fight every urge to stack everything on at once. Basically, when we deal with the extension tubes and when we deal with bellows, which is the next couple of slides, um, your minimum focusing distance gets really, really close to your subject and your depth of field is even smaller. So it's incredibly hard to figure out where exactly is in focus. And that just gets magnified if you're trying to stack everything on at once. So start with the skinny one and then build your way up. Here is a wonderful example of the um, 2X teleconverter on the 150 to 600. This is an unknown thing. This is a really fun, idea and it's an, it's an out of the box way to get macro photography. Um, I know many of you in Florida are privy to our 150 to 600. It is a beautiful birding lens and I've taken it out on the swamps there often doing the shorebirds and going to St. Augustine and seeing all the wildlife there. But if you have the 2X teleconverter already, think about it in a macro mindset. This combination will give you a one to two macro ratio. So it's half life size. We're focusing in on about a two inch by two inch area. And the advantage here is that you can photograph all the way to F81. You can get an incredibly long depth of field, putting everything down on a tripod. What I'll do is I'll set my tripod up level with my subject. And then once I get my tripod locked down, this will come up a couple of times, it is easier to move your subject than it is to readjust your tripod. So the game board, thankfully, was a nice backdrop, but I could slightly move that in and out until I could find proper focus. With the bellows, um, these, are, these are really great ways to get better than one-to-one. -one. So when I talk about better than one-to-one, -one, this is 200% life size. Um, generally, a one-to-one -one macro is the same as if you were to, to place the object on your sensor. So if your sensor is, you know, we're making some assumptions here that currently I'm using a full frame sensor. Um, and my object image is about an inch by an inch, roughly, that's that's one-to-one -one macro. And so two-to-one is better than life size. So now we're focusing on a little area that's a half inch by half inch. I can get all the way to, this is five-to-one magnification. So we're just getting closer and closer, focusing in on smaller and smaller subjects. These are both taken. So the, the Bellow set that I have is a really ancient set that's fully manual focus. And I literally have to be really, really, really close to my subject. Um, I actually had to deactivate this option in my camera that says, you know, photograph it when you can't read an f-stop. My camera is too smart for these bellows, so I had to disable some things and um, figure out the exposure manually. And honestly, what that is, is I set the aperture and then using a live preview, you can kind of see this through the LCD screen. 
you can actually change your shutter speed back and forth and it'll get brighter and darker so you can get in the ballpark of where you need to be. Don't think too hard about finding the correct exposure because um, it's visually now with digital, you can use your live view, get close and then make adjustments as you need. These were taken with a 50 millimeter old Nikkor MF lens. It naturally had a half life size. So it's similar to our 45. It's got a half life size magnification rate ratio. If I were to put a hundred millimeter on the same set, I could get 10 X magnification. Have I lost everyone yet? <laughs> we're still doing okay, right? There's going to be a lot of behind the scenes photos in here because I want you to see the setups. I want you to see kind of the process of how this is going. Um, I'm an avid craftsman. So I love sewing and just this idea of the thread going through the needle is, is so simple, but yet makes such a difference when you're sewing with a machine. All right, so when I'm working with bellows or when I'm working with extension tubes, this is the setup. This is kind of my tips and tricks to, um, you know, make sure we don't get frustrated with this. You have to be patient. This does take a lot of time to set up. I'm definitely working on a tripod. Um, number one, get comfortable with manual focus. A lot of times when you're stacking all of these things in between your lens and your camera body, there's no more electronic communication. Now there are some bellows out there that give you electronic, um, they'll, they'll allow you to put um, an, an EF mount on a digital camera and it will actually transfer the electronics back and forth, which makes metering and everything super easy, but it's very expensive. So if you can figure it out um, on your own and get comfortable with manual focus, it's, it's a great option just to kind of play and get, get creative. For micro focusing, because that's, that's the big thing. Again, our depth of field is very shallow, even at F32, even when we're opening these things up. So I use them with the live view magnification to fine tune your focus. This is different on different brands, but basically you look for a magnifier and you can have a five times magnification or a 10 times magnification. It's just giving you a closer look so that you can fine tune and get the, exactly that point in focus that you're looking for. Make sure your batteries are charged because that will suck the life out of your batteries in an instant. Again, with the game board number three, after your tripod is set, only make minor changes because getting everything reset up, that is a whole different production. You're basically starting over. So visualize the perspective you want to photograph first, visualize the photograph you want to take, and then build it as you go so that you're only making minor changes with micro focusing. If you have the ability to get a slide rack with your bellow set, this is very helpful for micro focusing. It's basically a, you know, a dolly track that your tripod head sits on and so you can actually very minimally move it back and forth. Um, otherwise, personally, I move my subject very minimally back and forth. It's just a little bit easier if you need and if you have the means. And then again, be patient. All right, number two, calculating magnification ratios. I throw this in here because again, I get many, many questions about extension tubes and trying to figure out exactly how do you like how do you know how close you can get? How do you know what the magnification is going to be? I want to photograph a 10 to 1 macro or 5 to 1 macro, but I need to know how to figure that out. So the equation is you take the original magnification ratio of the lens that you're using. It's in the point or the, the zero point X form. So basically, if you have a lens that's 1 colon 2, it's 0.5. You divide 1 by 2. If it's a you know one to four ratio, that's 0.25. You know you just divide, um, you just divide it to get the, the the multiplication ratio there, and then you add that to the length of your extension tubes in millimeters and the focal length of the lens divided by the focal length of the lens. This will give you the new magnification. So here's an example, and I got another example on the next page. Tamron 45 millimeter 1.8. It has a native magnification of about one to three, so it's point two, four, nine X. If we use a 36 millimeter extension tube on that lens, this is the thickest one out of that three pack that I showed you, our new magnification will be just about one to one. So 1.094 X. So that's just slightly better than one to one macro. And we did that because we took the 0.294 and we added that to 36 divided by 45, which is 0.8. Um, there's a really great site that I found this information on. Uh, it's from Cambridge in Color. It's a, it's a European website. It's got 
very in depth walks through this whole thing. Many of this information, when I was trying to find the actual documentation form of it, I did simple internet searches like how to calculate magnification ratio with extension tubes. And lo and behold, good things should happen. Here's another example. So the bellows that I was showing you with that needle, the bellows at full extension from that last example. So I used an old, the, the old Nikkor 50 millimeter 1.8 and its native magnification was 0.2x. It's a one to five macro. So if we use a 0.225 millimeter, 225 millimeter extension bellows, so that's my bellows extended all the way out, it's about eight inches. Our new magnification is going to be, I'll take the 0.5, from the old one. Nope, I lied. Typo, sorry. The native magnification is 0.5, so it's one to two macro. Um, and then you add that to 225 minus 50 and you get a 5x, so you get a five to one macro ratio. Hope I haven't lost you. But this is here for those people who need it. Again, don't get too bogged down on it if you don't quite get it, because we can go over it later on if you want. Hey, Kathy. I mean, Jillian, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, I got a question about the, where, they, where they find that uh, magnification ratio, where you got 0 0.2 to 0.295. I'm assuming that's in the specs of most of the lenses as far as that goes, because I, I see that all the time when I'm looking up for macro stuff my, for my own thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, at least on the, on the Tamron page, if you go to the specific product page, you scroll all the way down to the bottom where the, like, the MTF charts and the, and the filter size and all that tech specs are. Um, there is a magnification ratio put in there. Right. Cool. And Thank I'm you. sure the other ma uh, manufacturers do that too. Yeah, they do. Cool. So let's put this into practical use. Um, here is my photo from the title slide. Believe it or not, it is uh, the ace of spades on a deck of cards that I have. Again, trying to come up with examples that you guys can relate to. And I wanted to showcase and I wanted to... Um, I wanted to set up similar examples to try to get one-to-one -one macro if I were to use the 90 millimeter macro versus if I didn't have the 90 millimeter, I had other options. So this is the setup. Set up the, uh, the card. Yes, it is clipped to my coffee cup. And, you know, instead of lowering the tripod, I needed some extra height. So I put the coffee cup on top of the lens hood and I needed a little bit more. So I stacked that on top of the deck of cards. <laughs> Very technical stuff I'm showing you. Uh, the card is placed at minimum focusing distance for the 90 millimeter, which is about 11 inches. So that's the setup. Sitting under my deck, cloudy day, um, this sparkle foam core is there really just to help bounce the light back up and try to kill any shadows that might be in there. And here's what we got. So using the 45 millimeter, again, I'm trying to think about, okay, if I had a 40 or if I had a nifty 50, how can I get an image that's similar to the 90 millimeter at one to one. You can use the teleconverter. So I can put it at the 2x teleconverter. Um, I do not get one to one. Magnification ratio only increases slightly. It goes from one to three to one to two. But the added advantage here is that my depth of field or my minimum focusing distance actually gets expanded a little bit so that I have more working distance if I can't get close to my subject. The best results and the results that I get very often is um, I'll take again that thickest extension tube in my three pack and on the 45 millimeter minimum focusing distance or minimum object distance of nine inches um, that will give me that one to one ratio. So that is a very easy way to get one to one macro with the 45. Um, the tricky bit with that is um, you lose pretty much all autofocus at that point. If, if it's there, it's slow. And so if I'm not set up on a tripod, I will literally move the camera back and forth, try to find my subject and fine tune my manual focus when I need. So it's not as fast as the 90. If I stack all three extension tubes together, so um, there's a 36, there's a 20 and there's a 12 in that three pack, that will actually give me just about a two to one macro. The, the equation works out to 1.8 to one. Minimum focusing distance stays the same at nine inches, but you can see clearly how I have much better magnification. Again, manual focus is the key here, but you can get really great magnification out of a nifty 50 or a 45. Secondly, um, I tried the 85. So people ask me, you know, what's the difference between the 90 and the 85? Can I do macro with the 85? You can, 
but it takes all three extension tubes because um, the 85s, its minimum focusing distance is about three feet. So you have to be further away from your subject. And its native magnification is one to seven. So, you know, not even close to macro photography. Um, here's the comparison on the left with the 90 millimeter one to one. And then again, if I stack all three extension tubes together, I can get just about a one to one, just shy of one to one with all three of those there. This is talking about a uh, macro versus a not macro. So the other thing I wanted to mention is the biggest difference between having a 90 macro and an 85 1.8 is the field of view. When we talk about depth of field and the area of the plane that's in focus, macro lenses have a flat field of view, where non-macro lenses have a concave field of view. So the 90, it's flat. If you are parallel to the sensor plane, it is going to give you a very nice even edge to edge sharpness and you can clearly see that here. Um, with the 85 on the right hand side, these are both taken at f8, you kind of see that the, that the image kind of bows back a little bit. That's because of this concave field of view. This is exactly why in group photography settings, like if you've got like a big family reunion or a big group that you're trying to photograph, this is one of the reasons why we put people at a slight semicircle because the, field, the depth of field and the area of sharpness in that frame is slightly C-shaped. In a one-to-one -one macro setting, I love the 90. Um, the 90 gives flat, non-distracting backgrounds. It's great compression with longer telephotos. So if you have a 100 millimeter macro or an, an old 180 sitting in your closet, that telephoto compression is just going to more easily drop out your backgrounds and make it non-distracting. Where the 45 millimeter definitely has more of an ethereal quality. So this is taken at f4, 500th of a second, so that I can capture this. This is handheld. There's the behind the scenes. I grabbed a monopod, was honestly looking for spiders the other morning, but I couldn't find any. So I noticed all of the dew on the morning grass and immediately put down my coffee and, and started photographing these. You are so close to your subject matter. I'm maybe a half an inch from my subject matter. And that's advantageous because I can actually create my own shade. And especially in the bright sun like this, um, it gives me a really nice shady, even exposure for my imagery. All right, number three, um, getting it right in camera. So in the description, we talk about white balance. We talk about histograms. I kind of wanted to walk through an example set and show to you that getting it right in the camera makes all the difference. You know, personally, I don't like to edit my images too terribly much. I would rather be out in the field. I'd rather be talking to everyone. And so the little things that you can do in the field that you can get it right in the camera and just seeing that image before it's created, that's going to cut down on your, your processing time at the, on the back end of it. So from the first image, um, talking about just white balance, making sure your white balance is correct here. Um, the first image on the left that was taken with an automatic white balance setting where the image on the left or the right sorry was with a custom white balance setting getting to know specifically how to do custom white balance that's definitely a jpi question depending on the camera brand that you have depending on your skill level um, generally what i like to do if i'm using led lights um, i can set it to a specific kelvin temperature and then I'll set my camera white balance to that same Kelvin temperature and that takes care of everything for me. If you're outside on a sunny day, 5600 Kelvin is daylight. Um, you know, and if you really, you know, you really have to be perfect about it, um, get a white checker, you know, get like a color checker pro or, you know, one of those white balance tools that you can take a reference image first and then set your white balance to that after the fact. There's many different ways depending on your comfort level, but you can totally see the image on the right is a better image than the image on the left simply by getting the color right. So the next thing I want to do is just double check my histogram. Um, the first image here, it's a side light situation with my LED light coming from the right hand side. And reading my histogram, I know that there's going to be a lot of black values. That is this right here. So normally the, the general consensus is that your, um, your histogram has to be evenly set from left to right, but that's not true. 
Uh, the histogram is a graphical representation of what your image would look like if it is, um, you know, thrown onto a graph. The dark values are on the left, the light values are on the right, and this is a pretty close representation of what I have. I have a lot of black values, which is fine, a little bit of middle tones, and then this spike here on the, on the highlight side, that is all of this blown out stuff. And this is too much. I need to, um, I need to take care of that. So the next thing I do, it's got a little drawing of my setup, is I, put, I used a blackboard to help cut out some of that light. So um, this is simply, you know, dandelion, not one of those big dogwood ones, but just a normal dandelion that has gone to foof. And my LED light set at 5800 Kelvin was set right here on the right hand side. And then I used a blackboard. It's basically um, an eight by 12 piece of cardboard that's been wrapped in felt looks like this. I set that up right in between just to block a little bit of that light so it's not hitting my subject as abruptly, but it's still giving me enough light, better exposure on my subject, knocking out the background that is black. And then the last thing I noticed was I didn't like this image was really close, but I wanted a little bit more illumination here on that far left hand side on those little fuzzy bits. And so the last thing I did was I kicked, I kicked a flashlight in just behind it. That's this here. Well, that's this right here. Not so much that it's going to hit my background and illuminate and change that black value, but just enough right behind it to kick in, um, to kick in that light and light up those last little bits. And that's the final image. 45 millimeter with, with the 36 millimeter extension tube, really easy to do. There's the behind the scenes. Hey, Jillian? I was going to take, yeah. I'm sorry. Somebody was asking, uh, how long did it take you to figure all that out? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, all in all, it took about an hour. Um, I've had this image in my head for a long time. About a month ago, all of my friends were posting their dandelion images and I was like, oh, I was going to do that. And then I didn't because I procrastinate. But the idea was this like two of them left. It can be showing perseverance. It can be showing like a couple dancing. It can show, you know, whatever you want this to read into. But this was kind of the image that I had in my mind. And I love the white with the dark because that's a great histogram example. So this is the first one again when it's all blown out. And then watch the right hand side. After I killed that little bit of highlight, this is what I want it to look like. And so the hardest part honestly was setting up my tripod, trying to figure out what the minimum focusing distance is. Trying, you can see how close I am right here to, the, to my subject matter. Subjects do not have to be pretty. I've got a little, um, I made a little studio sweep out of a cigar box and some fabric. And um, I basically pinned this dandelion to some foam that I had on another prop. Again, it's not pretty, but it works. And then traditionally what I'll do, instead of moving my subject back and forth, before I even put that in play, I'll use my hand and, and just kind of sweep it closer to my lens. You'll get, the lights are on at this point, you know, I'm trying to calibrate everything in and I can kind of get a gauge for where my subject needs to be placed just by using my hand because you can see when your fingerprints get sharp. And then you place the subject in um, and then it's just building it, you know. Didn't realize it was going to take a three, you know, like a two light setup, but you see the first image, you say, okay, this is something I don't like. How do I fix that? You correct that problem. It's like, well, okay, now I need it to add this part. So how do I correct that? You add the flashlight in on the back. So I'd say about an hour. All right, last topic. The art of focus stacking. This is going to be the artistic approach to focus stacking, you know, even though we've had math in here, even though I used to be an engineer when I was in school for a short amount of time, uh, the artist in me has definitely, it's, the, it's taken over. And um, I'm a very conceptual artist at this point, but I, again, get a lot of questions about focus stacking and I just kind of wanted to inspire that with you out in the field. 
So the question I get often about focus stacking is why don't you just use a long depth of field? What is the difference between using stack, stacking and just setting a longer f-stop? Um, and you can kind of see the difference here. These are two images. One is the one on the left is stacked together. These are eight images taken at f4, 500th of a second, 6400 ISO. The one on the right is a long exposure shot. So this is an eighth of a second at f32 at 6400 ISO. The, you know, the striking difference between the two is just look at the shutter speeds. If I'm outside, this is the setup. I am outside white foam core. Um, I have the flower that I want to photograph on. Like it's, it's propped up with a stick and some clothespins because I don't have anything fancy to do that with. But anything slower than an eighth of a second, it wasn't sharp because the wind was blowing and this was outdoors. I'm not using a strobe or anything because again, I want this approach to be approachable to anybody. Um, so that's, that's tip one, number one. Focus stacking generally will give you better contrast. It'll give you, give you faster shutter speeds in comparison. Um, the other thing it does is it definitely gives you better clarity. So these are the same images, just magnified 5-10%. Um, at the F4, stacking these images together, you can clearly see the clarity and the sharpness. It's better on the one on the left than it is on the one on the right. Um, this is because of a couple of different things. You know, one, maybe it moved a little bit, again, because of that slower shutter speed, that's very possible. But also uh, there's this thing called pixel diffraction that I honestly didn't believe in for a long time, but more and more I do this, the more I see it in the field. Basically meaning you're, you're shining this light through a smaller opening, meaning the diffraction angles are more severe and you're opening up the lens for a longer time so the light has more time to bounce around. It's, it's an inherent side effect of having really long depth of fields and very stop down lenses. Um, but it does, it will affect the overall sharpness of the image. It's very situationally dependent, but it is something that's out there. It's called pixel diffraction if you want to look into it more on your own time. So with this image with the flower, these are the eight images that I took. And basically, again, manual focus. I figured out what, what my minimum focusing distance was for the setup. 45 millimeter, 36 millimeter extension tube. And then you just take multiple images focusing from the back and all the way forward. The other reason, so in, in a traditional sense, we will use focus stacking when you want to get absolutely everything sharp. Another example of when we use focus stacking is when you want only part of it sharp but you still want it out of focus. So like in this situation, I wanted the fence reflection inside of the water droplet to be sharp. And I wanted that little um, fence bit coming down to be sharp as well, but I didn't want the whole scene sharp. This image was a collaboration of just two pictures. So here's my setup. This one was taken with the 90 millimeter macro and all three extension tubes. You can see how physically close I am to this subject right here. And so I use these two pictures. And when you put it together, it looks like that. So, and when we work with, uh, yes, Janet, this is the next slide. Where, you know, you wanna find a software that works for you. Um, this is not the end all list. This is a, again, an internet search for top 10. Uh, there's seven there. <laughs> Another thing I have to fix. Um, you know, top 10 focus stacking softwares. You know, what do other people use? And um, these are not in the correct order, but these are the kind of the top ones that I found. Uh, Photoshop, of course, if you're really savvy. Uh, Photoshop is a very old school way. If you're really proficient in Photoshop, you can work with the layers and erase certain portions of it and it, it actually works very well, but you have to be good at Photoshop to be able to do that. Uh, Helicon Focus, it's very popular. It's, a, it's an annual prescription at, or subscription at about $30 a year with a lifetime uh, purchase of $115. So this is the most expensive option out of all of these, but it is the most popular. There's probably more tutorials on this than anything else out there. Um, I liked it. 
Um, I basically took the 30 day trials on all of these and just kind of played around with them. Um, I really liked Helicon Focus, but for my needs that are very simple, it was way advanced. Like it was so detailed, there was so much control and I didn't need that. So I didn't necessarily want to pay the subscription fee. Um, another one that's kind of fun is focusstackingonline.com. This is an online only platform and it's free, but I'll show you, it's a little finicky and I'll show you about that. Um, this works well if you just want, you know, if you just have like one example that you want to do. It's not a lifetime goal or it's not a hobby that you're going to do over and over again. Affinity Focus, that was a good one I tried too. I've got some examples of that. Um, it's a $50 one-time purchase. I think I got it on a Groupon for $25, so it was really affordable. And it gives me the control of Helion, uh, Helicon Focus, but it's simplified. So it's much easier to do, but you still have some control about it. Uh, the other ones... Zareen Stacker, this one can do like a thousand photos at once. Like it's a large stacking software. It's very technical. Um, it's about 90 bucks. And then the other two, Piccole and Combined ZP. Uh, these ones I couldn't try, but they are free. Uh, they're PC only. Best thing you can do again, just find something that works for you. Use the free trials and forget to cancel it if you don't want, if you don't want them. That's the catch. Here's that focus stacking online. Um, basically, this is again, just a website and you load the two photos that you want to stack. Those are those here. One of them is a reference photo. I just picked the top one arbitrarily and then you hit stack, it renders it. And then at the end, it will ask you to download it or you can clear or you can try it again if it wasn't quite right. Um, the trick here, I don't know if it's a for everybody thing, but like when I hit download, it wanted me to use an extension on my Google Chrome, which I wasn't comfortable downloading. So um, secretly, I just right clicked and hit save as and that worked really well. So that's a little trick for that. Again, really great for the one offs. This is affinity focus. It has a, it has a Photoshop kind of feel because it has all of these different images and I can go through and kind of finesse it or work with the layers, work with the saturation or whatever. Um, but I didn't do any of that. I just loaded them all in and here stack. And it renders really fun. Like I, I kind of want to take a better screenshot of this and print it out and hang it somewhere because it looks like a drawing. And it was really fun. Super easy. You've got some controls here on the on the left hand side. So again, if you want to add text or change the layers or mask certain things out, it has the expandability to get more in depth if you want to use it in that way. But again, my needs are pretty basic. Lastly, I want to leave you with some inspiration. So having some fun and finding some inspiration. Uh, this is the setup for my final example set. Uh, it is going a little crazy. I have the 90 millimeter macro on my Canon R. Um, I have all three extension tubes and in the middle of the extension tubes, I put the Tamron 2X teleconverter just for fun. I've never done it before. And then I have one very small LED light you can see on the bottom right there. Um, getting the focus was the hardest part here. So again, I kind of set it up where it's where I thought it would be. Um, thought that my spinny bar chair would be able to get high enough. Same sort of technique. I used my hand underneath the lens to figure out exactly how far away I needed to be and then stacked up my base with just books, magazines that I had lying around because you can do, you know, a quarter of an inch at a time, just stick another magazine on the pile. Works really well. So at the end of the day, when I'm out traveling, kind of reliving things, you know, if you go from the river basin to the forests, that's the, that's the item there on the left, to the desert, to the mountains. I just will hope to see you on another adventure. And that's it. Cool, that's really awesome. I got, I got some questions that I saved for you, if that's all right. Yes, please. All right. I'm happy to stay as long as you guys are staying engaged. Um, I have <laughs> 10 minutes to the hour, but I've got nowhere to be. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, was, we had somebody was asking, is that first class available online that you were talking about before? Your, yep. Okay. Do you have a link for it or is it on Tamron's website? Um, go to the Tamron Facebook page. It might be on there. Okay. It's, it's actually called, um, what, what was this one titled? Beyond My Macro Lens? Uh, yeah. 
or something Get, like that. Get, getting up close with my macro. <laughs> yeah. Uh, getting up close with my macro. That was actually the title for my old class, but it had the new description on there. This is why we had the phone call yesterday. Cause I'm like, right. which one do you want? Um, there is on the, on the home videos portion of the website. And I'll go back to that slide. I know I have a video on there of fun at home macro setup. So we talk about water splashing. We talk about um, focusing on fire, the game board. I've got a behind the scenes setup on that on there as well. So that one's really fun. Um, but the other class, I'll post it on my website if I'm teaching it anymore, but um, on the events section, it'll be on there too. But I know it's recorded somewhere, definitely recorded somewhere. I'll find a link and send it to you. Cool. Uh, I mean, I'll send it out to everybody who's got some stuff on there. Um, the other question I saw that came up uh, is uh, how important is sharpness to with, with, for you uh, personally with your photography? I mean, is it like, uh, I guess they're asking, is it, is it like super critical that everything can be super sharp all the time or you just kind of feel around for it? It is, I mean, the simple answer is yes, my images have to be sharp. Uh, because, I, because my editing is very minimal, I want the lenses to showcase for themselves and, and being a branded photographer for Tamron, I need to show that their lenses are sharp. You know, old school technique is like, nah, they're not that good. But the new stuff that we've been coming out over the last three or four years, it is so sharp and it is just remarkable. Um, however, if you notice that a lot of my work is very shallow depth of field, that is on purpose. My style in general, I, I, very, I gravitate towards depth and perceived distance. I also gravitate towards having a critical point of focus so that, um, you know, like in here, I, I want my viewer to look exactly where I want them to. And if this was completely sharp from front to back, the whole image itself would, would be very flat. Like the, the, percept, percepted, the perceived distance would be just really, really flat. That's what I wanted to say. So critical focus is critical, but um, I, I tend towards a shallow depth of field sort of look in my work. Cool. Uh, the other person was asking about, uh, about Lightroom. I don't recall Lightroom having a, a focus stacking. Uh, in, I think in their... they just added it. Did they just in the recent I update? I haven't but... played around with mine yet. Yeah, I know. I know it's in Photoshop, but I know, but I haven't seen it in Lightroom recently. So, and that would be with a cloud version, not in the old standalone version, if I remember mm -hmm, correctly. Mm -hmm. And the uh, somebody just popped up. Uh, another question just popped up. So, do you have an issue with dust in your photo stacking at all? <laughs> not if your sense is clean, Wanda. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes. Um, and you won't see it right away. Like in this picture for the desert, um, I finally found something cool to do with all these helicopters that have been all over my yard. There was a little spot when I got it back. Granted, this wasn't a stacked image, but there was a little spot like right here. There was a little spot like right here. So I went back in and healed it out after the fact. Um, if you do have dust, Thankfully, on all of your pictures, it should be in the exact same spot. So if you get a, a stacked image or a merged image back and you see dust, it's really easy to clone it out or, or, or you can, you know, if you know about it, do that beforehand and it'll make your stacks cleaner. Does anybody have any other questions for Ms. Dewey? I got a couple questions of my own, but I want to, I don't, I don't want to be monopolizing this. So. No, you're fine. But uh, does anybody else have any uh, questions for Ms. Dewey? Uh, there's some comments in here. I'll we'll go over those real quick. Uh, excellent closing guilt from, from Glidden. Yeah. Gorgeous. Um, Thanks from Janet. So one other, one, one other um, question I have for all of y'all again, cause this is the first time I've given this class on a technical value. Did you guys get it or was it over your head? We'll have to wait and see what they say. If you want. Like I'm just trying to get a gauge cause it was fantastic, actually. Good. I, I thought it was a little bit short. I was expecting longer, but it was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. When we have an hour, it's, it's hard to get super in-depth. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Yeah, uh, Janet's been uh, uh, messaging me privately. No, uh, Janet, you don't have to worry about the math. The math is really, it, it's just if you really want to get super critical with the stuff. But basically, just like she was talking about at the end, you know, 
you just kind of have to sometimes feel your way through some of that stuff too. So I I'm a firm believer in artistic math. So, and it's, it's so funny again, when I went to college, when I started university back in <laughs> a long time ago, um, I was going to be an electrical engineer. Like that was the goal. That was the track. And then I decided to be a photographer after a long talk with my parents and every once in a while, those equations start creeping back in and, and I've, I've lost the brain for it. Like it, it's very concept. It's very loosey goosey right now. This one was my favorite to put together. This is knives stacked up. I've got a butter knife and a, um, like a little fillet knife and a bread knife. Stacking metal is hard to do. And this is another example. Like I could have had a strong depth of field all the way through, but because in my mind, I'm thinking mountains, I wanted it to recede. I wanted it to look further back as we went through. Yeah, I, I've seen some of, I've, I looked at some of your work before online and that just stuff is just phenomenal. Thank you so much for sharing this. That means a lot. All right, again, reach out, stay connected to us at um, Tamron with me at Bell Tamron USA at JPI. You know, we are all here for you. Um, I love being creatively challenged and just collaborating with other artists. Yeah. Yeah. To make sure you follow her over on, on Tam, I'm um, sorry, at, at, Tamron, at Bell Tamron USA. Uh, and I've been trying to tag you in, in, in that video. Like, I don't know if I did a good job, but I'll, once it's finishing posting, I'll make sure you get a, a, a good tag in there. So that way it's, it, it definitely pops up. Um, um, Don, do you guys have any classes coming up? We do have classes coming up. Um, we got, um, we, right now we're doing mainly just online classes. I've just finished a whole series of webinars uh, that I was doing because uh, we, we, our store was shut down for a month. So I started doing webinars at home. Uh, try to try to keep everybody active. So we, we were doing all that. In fact, uh, Jeff kind of jumped in with some of the folks from Tamara, like Ken and uh, Armando, where we basically jumped in as well, helped out. So we had some uh, some pretty good things going on. Um, I actually just did a macro uh, thing too, but nowhere near <laughs> the uh, the depth you went into as far as that goes. Mine was like, a, hey, yeah, it looks good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up our, our class links. So I have the two that I am teaching primarily for June and July is this Beyond Macro and my food and products class. That's my other love. I'm not a cook, I'm not a foodie, but I love styling food. <laughs> um so I'm gonna go hopefully find the events page. Um if you want to know anything about like who's teaching where. It would be the events page for Tamron.com. See if I can look it up real quick. <laughs> when's, were you asking me, Glidden, or are you asking Jillian when's the food class? <laughs> are you are you hungry? That's the question. <laughs> no, no, I'm not hungry, but I, I would love to see her teaching that class because I have been paying attention to that that type of photography and I wanna get better at it. So awesome. here's the link. Um, and, and I don't, if, if you don't mind, I can tell you that I am teaching it, but I don't want to promote other stores since I'm talking to you and you're so grateful to have me. <laughs> um, but the, the food class, I'm giving it a bunch, but I'm giving it tomorrow with a store out in Seattle. Okay. Um, it would be about one o'clock your time. And um, next Tuesday, I'm going to be giving this Beyond Macro class again with a store out east. And then the week of the sixth, I've got a bunch of stuff coming up too. Um, basically, if you go to the events link and anything really involving food photography, this Beyond Macro class, even though Armando might teach it well and he is wonderfully technical, yeah. um, or the my macro class might be up there again too. Cool. Any other questions, guys? I don't know. I don't, I don't, so they, at least I don't see anything popping up. Um, I didn't see anything pop up on, on Facebook, so uh, so I think we're all go, we're all golden here. Cool. Well, I, I just want to say uh, thank you very much to everyone who came. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You guys, uh, uh, you know, you were kind of quiet, but that's okay. That's fine. I'm assuming you're absorbing the blow of all the info and everything else. So <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed. I see a lot of thank yous and everything else in there. So. We appreciate the response. That really means a lot to all of us. 
uh, for everything like that. And I want to especially thank Miss Jillian for, for coming down, well, not coming down here, but signing online and yeah. uh, giving us a presentation for this. It's been, uh, you know, with everything that's been going on, it's been wonderful to have for, for, for them to be able to reach out and be able to share this stuff with us because this is just stuff that we would normally do here at the store and give you guys these classes. But, and of course we would all prefer to be interacting one-on-one -on -one with everybody, with everything, but it's just really, it's just nice to be able to be able to give you guys all this stuff. And thank you, Jeff, for, for putting all this together too. I really appreciate that. All right. Anything else guys? I think that's about it. Yep. All right. Uh, then I am going to uh, just get uh, basically sign off and process everything and then we'll go from there again thank you everybody for, 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 for thanks everybody it's been a good day